Okay, it's recording now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Today I'm talking to Professor Ian Shipsey, head of the physics department in Oxford and fellow of the Royal Society. What was your motivation to have a career in physics? So what started really was like as a kid. So I grew up in, in a block of flats, high rise block of flats in East London. And growing up in East London, you don't see the sky at night. What you see is an orange glow. But from quite a young age, uh, once a year, my parents would go on family holiday. Uh, myself, and my parents and my sister would go to the coast. And when you got to the coast, at night the sky was absolutely inky black. There was very little light pollution because there were very few people. And I'd get to see the night sky. And I was astonished by how beautiful it was and wanted to know what it was. And so I asked my father to tell me about the stars and he could tell me a bit, but he didn't have an education. He was not a scientist or anything like that, and neither was my mother. And so I remember coming home from the holiday the first year, I was probably about, first time I can remember was about six or seven, and going to the local library and just trying to find a book about astronomy. And so I did that. And then this happened again the next year. And the next year, uh, the teacher at school, when we all got back, said, I would like all of you to make a poster about your what you did this summer, whatever it was. And so people did different things. This was a very poor working class part of London. Many people, parents didn't have the money to go on holiday. However, in my case, I talked about the night sky that I'd seen. And so the poster was stars and planets. And then everyone in the class had to vote or what was the best, post, best poster. And so they chose mine. And the result of that was that the teacher said, and the prize for the winner is that everyone gets to make posters about the night sky, but they all got to be different. So the whole class made posters, 30 kids, and we put them all around the school and decorated the school like the solar system in a galaxy. And it was just a very exciting. Everyone loved it. And I saw how popular science was. And I don't think I thought that before. You know, I was eight or so, nine maybe by then. In any case, that got me interested. I read more books in the library. The local library was tiny, so I read all the books very quickly and <laughs> probably only about 10. Then I went straight on to reading science books. And one of those was a chemistry book. And it was not meant for people my age. It was meant for much more advanced level. I couldn't understand some of it. However, I read a piece about, about it that described how chemistry was kind of related to how electrons are arranged around at, in atoms. And it mentioned something called the Pauli exclusion principle. I had no idea what that was, of course, but it fascinated me. And um, I realized at that point that chemistry, which had got me interested because I had a chemistry set, was actually not so interesting at all. It was the Pauli exclusion principle that was interesting. So I wanted to know about that instead. And so I found out in the library and found a book about physics. No, it didn't explain how the exclusion principle that was too advanced, but it gave me some interest. And I think that's how I got into physics because I realized there was a guy on the TV at the time. Um, he's no longer alive, but it was a very famous program. It's still running called The Sky at Night. It's one of the longest running television programs in the history of the world. And in those days, when I was a kid, it was run by a guy called Patrick Moore. And he was an astronomer who would know, knew who his audience was. And a big piece of it was young people. And he would say, all those watching that want to be an astronomer one day, you've got to get a physics degree. That's what you need to do next. And so I was inspired by that, and that went into the kind of into my brain. And eventually, uh, I decided to go to university. Uh, it wasn't obvious to go to university, but if you want to be a physicist, it was. So I persuaded my parents to let me go, and they did. And that's how I ended up becoming a physicist. That's that's a short story. But does that answer your question? Right. Yeah, that definitely answers my question. Yeah, it's a very mm -hmm. interesting start into your career. And uh, what fascinates you most about particle physics? Well, the thing that fascinates me most is the idea that we can understand how the universe was born and how it will evolve and how it will end entirely in terms of the interactions of fundamental particles. And this is not something that's obvious at all. In fact, it wasn't obvious to professional physicists uh, uh, in the early days of physics, but it became more obvious. Uh, there was a, a seminal book written by Steven Weinberg. Uh, I don't know what year it was written, but 
I'm guessing, sometime in the 1970s. But it became a bestseller, and it became, uh, before The Brief History of Time came along from Stephen Hawking, that book, Weinberg's book, was very, very popular, very well known. And, and what it talked about was understanding the universe from the perspective of a particle physicist, but recognizing that there were two great theories, quantum mechanics and general relativity, and not knowing how to unify them, or if, even if they could be, but the two together give an incredibly compelling account of how we can understand the universe. The fact the universe is knowable is just amazing. And the fact that we can create in our laboratories experiments, or we can build small instruments that can look at the world in a new way, perhaps with a particle beam, perhaps just by putting a little camera under the ground and saying if a dark matter particle passes through and causes an interaction with it, or building an interferometer that can detect either gravitational waves or dark matter, or building a telescope using the technology that comes from particle physics, which is the type of modern CCD that we use, for example, in uh, the Rubin telescope, and use it to understand how the shape of the universe has changed with time, dark energy. And these things are deeply related to each other, that, the Higgs, inflation, all these things are scalar fields. And they could be connected in some way. I don't mean that they're all the same particle, but that they are, they all have things in common that can help us understand at a deeper level. There's so much left to do that that's the other thing. If it was just that there was a great experiment to do, and I did one, I was lucky when I was a student, I did an experiment that turned out to be extremely important for the world. But at the time, it was just an experiment I was interested in. The reason I did it was because the experiment was advertised as learning more about why the universe is full of matter instead of antimatter, which is an interesting question, very interesting question. And we actually made progress in answering that question when I was a student, which was a great way to begin. But you know, I could have chosen a different experiment, had a different experience. In any case, what I learned was there was a lot to be discovered. And the more we know, the better we're able to delineate what we know and also what we don't know. And what we don't know at the moment is most of the universe. So it's an incredibly exciting field. And it's only got more exciting the time. So I'm one of the luckiest people alive to be doing this. And I think everyone doing particle physics is incredibly lucky, but I would say that's true of physics in general and science in general. I mean, each of us is drawn to a different type of science, but science is the most incredible thing, truly incredible, as is, of course, engineering, technology, medicine. They're all remarkable. And uh, where any one of us that does any of those things is incredibly fortunate. And one of our jobs should be to encourage others to follow in our footsteps and also try it out and see if they like it as well. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that's uh, all very true and yeah, very inspiring points that you mentioned. Uh, one last question, what makes Oxford a special place? So I think that everywhere is special and why that's true is because everywhere there are special people. So anywhere you go, you'll find people that believe the world will be better tomorrow. They're optimistic. They're optimistic because they know as scientists that science, technology, engineering, and medicine are the solution to the challenge of the environment. In other words, climate change, especially physics, because to understand climate is to, is to apply physics. Physics dictates climate. And then the strategies to address that challenge include clean energy, for which, for example, photovoltaics or uh, fusion. And they're both underpinned by physics. So physics plays a big role, but physics also plays a big role in developing uh, strategies for uh, developing uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which can be then applied to design better drugs and have mastery over pandemics. So physics is central to th things like medicine. It's central to things like um, climate. It's central to realizing and improving the human condition. For example, you remember that you learned it when you were undergraduate, that when the transistor was invented in 1947, that's only possible because of quantum mechanics. And the people that invented it had no idea in 1947 that what it would lead to. They knew it was really important. But the original transistor was probably the size of a bit less than the size of your fingernail, small fingernail. And today, when you pick up a mobile phone, you may have 100 billion of those transistors. The original inventors of the transistor could not imagine the telecommunications that it would enable, they couldn't imagine the internet, couldn't imagine laptops, mobile phones, or much of the technology that we have in hospitals today. But what's really exciting is that what's coming out of physics over the last five to 10 years in particular is 
mastery over quantum mechanics, using quantum mechanics in ways that's quite different than before, things like entanglement and so on, and superposition, which will give rise to new quantum devices that will totally change the world. And we have our living standards in the West are dictated by our ability to make modern communications, modern technologies in general, and to have the whole world live in a good way, in the way we live today. Most people in the world today are still living in poverty. To make it possible for everyone in the world to share in the wonderful existence that we have here and then look after our earth and nurture it requires physics, and physics has the hope. So what's special about Oxford, say, compared to anywhere else, is only the following, that I, I meet more people that are more optimistic here than I've met at other places. So there's more optimism. But there's optimism everywhere, but there's more here. There's a real belief that we can make the world together better. And we saw that very, very uh, viscerally when we were involved in the development of the vaccine. Although, of course, in physics, we were not developing the vaccine itself. We did much work, along with many colleagues and other departments, in support of an overall uh, campaign against COVID. And it was successful. And in physics, we developed rapid testing, for example, of COVID. And being part of the excitement and the challenges of, of the huge number of people working to address social problems here in Oxford, in the case of the pandemic, people were putting together, we had meet Zoom meetings every couple of weeks where we'd all be informed of how things were going and be full part of that. And to make a difference to the world through that vaccine was a spectacular thing. And our physics played a modest role, but we were part of the big team and it taught us about the continuity and interactions of, of physics itself, that physics is everywhere and science is a continuum. And so, yeah, so Oxford is special because there's just so many talented, people here who are really optimistic. And, to, and let's hope that the whole world becomes like Oxford, I would say. If that was possible, I, don't, I think we'd solve all the planet's problems together as humanity. So is that, I hope that's a decent answer for you. Yes, yes, it is. Thank you very much for yeah. your insightful answers to these questions. That was Professor Ian Shipsey. And thank you everyone for watching and have a good day. Thank you very much.